Hi, everyone. I'm Scarlett Fu with Bloomberg Television. Welcome to the latest edition of Cornell Tech at Bloomberg. This is our speaker series where I sit down with leading figures in global technology. We're talking about entrepreneurs, investors, and thinkers. And our aim is to bring you engaging conversations that will produce new insights and also raise some compelling questions. If you want to catch up on our prior episodes, you can do so. Check out the Inside Bloomberg page on YouTube and, of course, stream our podcast, Cornell Tech at Bloomberg, on all major platforms. Now, in this month's edition, I'm thrilled to welcome Gustav Solderstrom. He is Chief Research and Development Officer at Spotify. It's a big title, and Gustav has a big portfolio at Spotify. Gustav has also founded two companies, both of which he sold to other companies. So we'll dig into that as well and talk about his journey and the lessons he's learned at Spotify. Gustav joins us from Stockholm. Thank you so much for joining us today, Gustav. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. So I always like to start by understanding our featured guest's background. You studied engineering in your native Sweden, and then you started your first company right out of school, which is pretty remarkable. What gave you the confidence to take such a big risk so early in your career, before you even got started? Well, I, I wish I could say it was um, vision and fortitude and the drive to be an entrepreneur, but the truth is more mundane and maybe more instructive. Uh, it was the fact that when I graduated from uh, the World Institute of Technology in Stockholm, you couldn't actually get a job in Sweden. This was the tail end of the of the IT crash. And so there were simply no jobs to be had. And my plan was actually to work where I did my master thesis job, but I couldn't, even though I thought I did a good job with the master thesis. So I basically had to start something myself because there was no option. And that was actually true for a lot of other people around me, really smart people. They had They had no alternative income. So they were actually very, very cheap. And they all said, let's do some things better than nothing. So in a sense, it was a unique moment in time where you could get access to fantastic talent uh, that didn't have anything better to do. So that's actually how I got into entrepreneurship. OK, so you started this company called Kennet Works. Can you explain to us what it did and, and what happened to it? So as I said, this was right after the, the IT crash. when. There had been these great expectations on mobile uh, network technology, you know, 3G and so forth, happening before the the IT horse, and and all of these expectations they kind of came crashing down, and no one believed in the internet. They didn't believe, certainly not in the mobile internet. Smartphones would never happen. Everyone was very disillusioned, but all the investment had already happened, right? So there were 3G networks, there were smartphones out there, the internet was scaling, so everything was there, but no one believed in it, and so. What we simply did was we said, let's take these smartphones. It was based on the work I had done in my method, master thesis. Let's take these smartphones and uh, let's build a little client where you can send text messages over data instead of as text messages. Which, And if you sent these messages over data, even though you actually paid per, per uh, megabyte back then, it was still 1 1,000 the cost of sending a text message. So it was basically mobile messaging, which sounds very non-interesting now, but back then, <laughs> cheap mobile messaging was a, was a big thing. So what happened to it? Because you ended up selling this company, Kennet Works, to a pretty big Silicon Valley firm. Yeah, so what happened was um, the, the the carriers, the, what we call mobile operators in, in, in Europe, they didn't really like the fact that this was 1,000 the cost of a text message because this was the revenue source. So there was always the threat that they would basically shut this down because back then they they could they controlled the gateways to the mobile internet, and so we 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 figured out who we had to kind of uh, to kind of work with, and we figured that the biggest messaging clients on desktop at the time they were um, it was actually Yahoo Messenger, so we ended up in an acquisition discussion between some of the big uh, the big internet players back then. Um, and one of them being being Yahoo. And so the idea was that we would take Yahoo Messenger, which was the biggest messenger on desktop, and add our technology to take Yahoo Messenger mobile. And that with this big company, chances that we would get shut down by mobile operators or carriers uh, were much less. Mm. So so we decided to, to find an ally. And, and in retrospect, when you look at what actually happened with WhatsApp and so forth, the YC thing would have been to stay independent and just make the bet. Yeah, but you're ahead of your time there. So you went to go work for Yahoo for a while, and um, I know that you learned a lot of lessons about how to move forward in the technology world. 
I want to get to the next company that you worked for after Yahoo, which is Spotify. What initially attracted you to the company? And, and give us a sense of where the company was at when you joined it, because you had met Daniel Ek when you returned to Sweden, and um, he had this idea. I don't know if it was a germ of an idea or it was something more developed than that. Well, that's right. So I had um, come back from working for, for Yahoo and Sunnyvale for a few years and really learning about the technology space, getting to know a lot of people in Silicon Valley who, who turned out to start companies like, like Twitter and so forth later. And so I really got bitten by, by the technology and entrepreneurs and bug. And I knew I wanted to work in this space. So I came back to Stockholm trying to figure out what to do, maybe start another company or something. And that's when I got introduced by a mutual friend to Daniel Ek. And he told me the vision he had for Spotify. And he did actually have a demo uh, of a, f a functioning demo that completely blew me away. So I would say I was, I was convinced by the product, which means I was actually convinced by the engineering um, by the engineering team and the engineering skills of this team. I knew nothing about the music industry, which was fortunate because, uh, as I later learned, everyone advised me against joining this company because the history is just littered with roadkill in, in, in music technology. So I, I knew little enough uh, about uh, rights holders and enough about technology to join this company. Were you listening to pirated music like almost everyone in Sweden was when, when you joined Spotify? I mean, what was your relationship to music? You said you didn't know anything about the industry, but did you enjoy it? What were your thoughts on it? So basically, Sweden was was the was a haven for piracy. It was completely legal. There were there were there were uh, uh, members of parliament who argued about we can't criminalize an entire generation. Information should be free. There was even a party called the Pirate Party. Uh, which was very big in, in in Sweden, and so there were no there were no repercussions, not even morally, um, with with piracy, and and this is really the, the the growing grounds for for Spotify, why it happened. But it's also interesting because that's what Spotify had to compete with. Mm -hmm. They had to compete with a landscape where music was already free. In fact, it was free with no advertising. You could offline sync, and you didn't pay anything. So so that was that was everyone's including my experience of of music. Mm. And so it was actually a great consumer experience. It just didn't work at all for the artist side and that was Daniel's vision. Like this consumer experience of piracy is actually great for consumers. I, he thought everyone should get access to all the music in the world. It just didn't work for for artists or rights holders at all. So among the many things that you do at Spotify, you took over mobile, you took over product development and all product development, and then all of engineer. It seems like you're responsible for almost everything except content at this point. Um, but you do host a podcast as well at Spotify. It's called Spotify, a product story. And really it's an inside account of uh, product at the company and also a masterclass in how to create a compelling podcast. Um, there are nine episodes and you do a great job throughout the episodes of sprinkling in important lessons learned uh, in Spotify's product evolution. So for our audience, which is made up of leaders and future leaders, entrepreneurs and tech enthusiasts, what do you think are the most important lessons for this audience? What do you wish you knew back when you were starting off? Yeah, so first of all, I just want to say that uh, I don't do everything on Spotify and there are many other people <laughs> that, do, that do a lot of really important okay. things. And uh, so I just want to get that on the record. Uh, but the reason we did this podcast was, it was twofold. One was, uh, I felt that um, as I was very passionate about entrepreneurism, what was a good way to, to give back? What is the most valuable thing that we have right now? And one of the most valuable things we have is a lot of learnings. So could we structure that? I was trying to mentor people privately, which is not very scalable. You transmit all your knowledge one person at a time. And so this was part of it. The other part of it was uh, um, me and, and uh, Veronica who helped me felt that we there wasn't really good examples of companies uh, being able to give a sense of what it would felt, feel to be inside a company when you were on the outside. So the idea was to do something that was quite representative of how we actually work for, for recruitment purposes. So you listen to this, you should get a decent sense of what it would feel like to work at Spotify. And what I always loved about podcasts is that when I listen for, for you know several hours to someone explaining how they think or when they converse with someone else, I get the sense that I know this person, even though they don't know me. And so what if you could start a Spotify, but you feel like you actually know a bunch of people here from day one because you've heard them already. 
That was the idea. And so going into the lessons, we actually try to structure each episode around a specific event because I feel that product development strategy can be very abstract. You know, you have these perfect theoretical cases of how things could work. So we, we took something that really happened to us and we try to break it down into product lessons. And we go through many, many lessons. So we ask ourselves the question of why would, um, if, if, if Sweden already had all the world's music for free without ads and offline sync, why did Spotify succeed? It was mm -hmm. already free. It was already had a bigger catalog. Those kinds of questions, mm -hmm. and and right th in that case, the um, the answer is actually convenience. That's the product lesson. It didn't have more music. It actually had less. It also had ads. It didn't have offline sync. It wasn't mobile. It was actually worse in many ways, but it was much more convenient to use because it was instant. You didn't have to download the files. So we try to abstract these lessons over time, and we see that again and again. Convenience trumps everything, basically. So people are really, so really lazy when it comes that's down the other to way to, that's that's the other way to put it. Laziness <laughs> trumps everything, right? And but the and and you see that lesson again a few years later. We added a mobile tier where it wasn't free anymore. We actually needed to charge for mobile because it was offline, you couldn't play ads and so forth. And it had to it had to be legal. And so then the question is if you could already offline sync all your pirated files to your iPod for free or to your to your music MP3 player for free. Why would you start paying, you know, $120 per year for the same thing you already had for free? That also makes no rational sense, um, unless you think everyone is truly altruistic and will pay just to support artists. But that's not what piracy showed us. Turns out again, convenience. People were prepared to pay $120 per year just for more convenience. And that's interesting because when we surveyed them before, they all said no. They did, but they couldn't imagine themselves actually paying that much for convenience. So those are some of the interesting lessons we've learned over the years. So it goes back to what economists always say, Gustav, which is watch what people do, not what they say. People have really high expectations for themselves and how they think they'll behave in the future, but that doesn't always pan out. And it's something, did you know that going in or is that something that you learned the hard way and you continue to learn over and over again? Well, I would not say we knew it going in. These are things we, we learned uh, over the years, but exactly that lesson is one we, we, we took to heart. So we do a lot of user research now about new products, but it is important to understand what it is you get when people say what they think they will do. You get exactly that, what they think they will do. That doesn't mean that they will do that. And in many cases, they don't. So you get exactly what you ask for, what they think they will do, and that's instructive in some cases if you present a price plan and say what you know what about five dollars versus ten what they think they will do is maybe quite likely what they will do in that case but if you're trying to ask them what they you know how they they think they will use a product down the line they usually have no idea because they can't yeah. estimate their own convenience right or how much they think it's worth after they have used it for six months so it's good it's good for for maybe things that are sort of early in the funnel where you almost okay. get the value immediately because then the consumer can imagine what it would be worth. But it's, it's not very useful for anything that doesn't exist yet. No one knows how to value something that they've never tried. They have no reference frame. And it's certainly not useful for, for, for understanding what will happen down the line. On the contrary, we found that making a bet so, almost against yourself is the most valuable thing. When you don't even think yourself that this is going to be valuable, that's the bet Spotify made. And eventually, after being you know, six months on the free tier, it turned out that you start using music so much that you actually do think it's valuable, valuable enough to pay for. Okay, so that's listener behavior and, and things that you learned as you went through everything. Of course, in the last two years, we've had this, this pandemic that disrupted everything and threw everything for a loop. I know that you guys collect a lot of data. You see how your cons your, your customer, your consumers are behaving, how their behavior is changing over time. Can you share any data with us about people's habits? I mean, what have you learned that has surprised you in terms of what people listen to um, during COVID? Music versus podcasts, has the balance shifted? Is it old favorites? Are they discovering new things? What, what, what have you gleaned from the data? So uh, a few things happen. In retrospect, several of them are predictable, uh, but it was hard to know going in. So, so one thing that uh, clearly happened that, that isn't that surprising when you think about it is we saw our mobile usage drop quite significantly. And so why did that happen? Well, it turns out that a lot of the mobile usage is people listening in the cars and people stopped driving. So they stopped listening on mobile. 
And then when we look closer at our data, and that looked pretty scary, but when we look closer at our data, we saw an almost inverse correlation in people listening on TVs and speakers because they were staying at home instead. So it turned out that in markets where, where we had a good penetration of, of uh, our ubiquity program, meaning you can play Spotify on TVs and speakers and PlayStations and these things, the consumption basically just shifted from one device to another. Whereas in markets where we were much more mobile only, it was actually it was actually a dip in, in overall consumption for a while, right? So that that taught us something about the the reliance of being ubiquitous, so that people can shift the same listening for a new situation. It had to work in the car, but then when you don't use the car, all of a sudden the living room is really important. Mm -hmm. And we were really good in both in some countries and not so good in both in other countries yet. And and you could see that play out in the data. So that was um, that was imp important to us, and and an interesting learning. Then in terms of behavior, there were some other obvious things. We had we had invested heavily in products um, specific for the car again, something called your daily drive, which was going really well, which is a personally programmed playlist with news and music in your taste as you drive to work. Obviously, that was a bad fit for a COVID world. So we pivoted and uh, we created something called the GetUp, which is similar in, in hypothesis, but it's not it's not focused around driving driving to work. So that's an example of how we adapted our, our product development. Now, mm -hmm. in terms of listening habits, we, we do see some of these things where we certainly see more consumption on meditation content, sleep content. We, we can clearly see signs of anxiety uh, in the world and how people try to alleviate that uh, using music and using uh, podcasts. Mm -hmm. so, so that's a clear sign. And, and so we try to try to make that easier. We try to program towards those those trends. We have editorial playlists, for example, that we can see, you know, around the calm, focus, sleeping. These have these have increased. So we do see that that kind of data. Overall, I want to say that while we're hopefully on the tail end of COVID now with vaccines rolling out, at least in, in certain countries, uh, this is not over. Like we're still in the middle of this. And consumer behaviors just sh shifted drastically. And so it's still very unclear what the end state will be. Will it go back to exactly what it was? I don't think it will. I, th I think um, some trends were just, one model to think about this is things that were already happening that were just drastically accelerated. Mm -hmm. Maybe some of it goes back, but a lot of it will, will probably stay. So we saw a lot more live consumption, for example, mm -hmm. which is something that, that I think it may retreat a little bit as people go back to physical life and, and uh, spending more time outdoors. But I do think it will end up being a, an acceleration that sticks around to some extent. How long do you think, or how long are you planning for some of these behaviors to stay with us? Are you thinking in terms of months or in years at this point? So I think these, these um, if you think about it as acceleration of behaviors, I think many of them will stay around forever. Mm. I think maybe the acceleration w had a bit of a boost and it will go down a bit and then continue to climb slowly. But I don't think it will go down to where it was mm -hmm. and stay flat. I think you can think of it as like this was already happening slowly. It got a big bump. And so maybe we maybe we accelerated two years into the future is one way to think about it. Or three years into the future in some cases, certainly for right. video conferencing, this might have taken three to five years if, if this had happened. You mentioned playlists earlier, get up the, the get up playlist or the daily drive. When it comes to playlists, it's driven by Spotify's recommendations and you know algorithms and all of that. How do you ensure that those recommendations are actually introducing listeners to new music, including things that people might not like on their first or second listen, as opposed to just reinforcing what people already like and already have on their own playlists? I mean, you are Spotify is meant to be a discovery vehicle. How do you ensure that it's introducing people to things that they have never had exposure to? Exactly. That's a great question. And there, there are two parts to this answer. What, one is the, the structure of the application and the, and the user interface. So we try to build vehicles for discovery where you as a user can tell us, like I'm in discovery mode. So for example, Discover Weekly, this is something you go to and you clearly show us that when I'm over here, I just want new stuff. Don't give me old stuff because it's called Discover Weekly. Uh, release Radar. So we have these vehicles where you can self-select when you're in discovery mode. And then we have these other things. We have one we have one thing literally called time capsule. And the whole point is that you're never surprised. This is, a, this is supposed to be what you listen to in your teenage years, right? <laughs> be very 
weird if if you were surprised by new music there. So one way is just the the craft of producing different musical products for your different um, for your different intents. Mm -hmm. And some people are in discovery mode some of the time and not in discovery mode other other times. Some people we see in our data is, are just much much more prone to discovery overall. They want to discover almost all the time. Some people don't. So we we try to reflect that. Then on the on the algorithm side, I think it's a really interesting challenge because as as you say, if you take a very short term machine learning approach, the most if you're trying to predict the most likely next thing that a user will click on, it will always be the best bet to recommend what they already listened to. You know, listen to the same thing you played the most one more time. For every it will always be the best performing. Yet we all have a sense that if you keep doing that for a while, users are gonna leave, right? Mm -hmm. So how do you find this balance between what in the short term always seems to be the most statistically best thing to recommend again and again, and users click on it so they clearly want it, but you know they're going to leave you. This is an interesting challenge. I think it's true for all recommendation systems. You know, if you use a video service, you want to discover something new every now and then. Then you want to go really deep on that, but you need to discover something new. So we're, we're experimenting a lot with looking at more what is called more long-term rewards, right? Mm -hmm. In machine learning, there's this field called reinforcement learning that tries to look at rewards uh, down the line. So instead of just trying to look at the next click, which is always going to bias towards the, the showing the same thing, if you show a recommendation for something new, maybe there's a slightly bigger chance that they don't click this in the moment. Mm -hmm. But then instead of looking at that, you look at what happened to, to this cohort of users that saw some new stuff five weeks down the line. And you may find that they actually retain even better. Right. So I think the trick is to be more long term. And the truth yeah. is, many problems in society is about being too short term. And I think recommendations is exactly the same thing. If you're a new artist um, who is not Justin Bieber or um, not Beyonce, how do you ensure that you can be one of the new clicks? You can be the next click. Um, is there anything that you can do as, as an artist or is this something that you kind of have to leave to Spotify's algorithms? So, so this is not a great question. Algorithms tend to to focus on the most likely thing. They, they tend to be slightly short term, and mm -hmm. they tend to focus on popularity. Both of those are safe bets for an algorithm. So we just talked about how you can be more more long term, and and what we see is by by introducing people to more discovery, that's actually long term better, for, mm -hmm. in the in the sense that that user sticks around longer and clearly seems to enjoy the service longer and wants to pay longer. So it's good for us and good for the user. So that's one reason to just introduce new music. Now, when you talk about the, the sort of popularity curve, that's also really important. And so we actually, we talk a lot about algorithms, but we actually have a very big editorial team at Spotify, hundreds of people across the globe who are experts in different genres. And, and we combine them with the algorithms. We call it algotorial. So um, humans have the ability, an expert in, in uh, reggaeton, for example, has the ability to, to say, to say that here's this new thing. I think it's super cool. Like it has no place in our system. The machines would say this is this is not popular yet, mm -hmm. but I want to make a bet on this, right? So they have the ability to program these things into playlists and for that, and that's a way to basically expose it. And it gets tested in a sense. So we have the ability for humans to kind of take control of the steering wheel and steer this machine in different directions. Now, if they steer it completely wrong and no one liked this music, then it self-corrects because mm -hmm. it doesn't get any place. But more than more than more than seldomly, they are right. They have humans are very very advanced uh, beings. They have much better intuitions than machines do. So we try to leverage humans for what they are really good at intuitions about non-discovered things. Mm -hmm. So that's one way for for new artists to to get a chance. We also have this program where you can literally pitch your music to our editorial team to make it much more transparent and fair. So that it's 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 not random or just based on, th you know, connections you don't understand. That's interesting that there's that human curation part of it that works in um, concert with the algorithms, and and I like the the idea that there's a vehicle that new artists can pitch to. Overall, as as someone who oversees product at at Spotify, how is developing a product for music different than developing a product for audio? Um, you know, and here we're talking about podcasts, for instance. So th that's a that's a great question and and one thing that I think is underrated uh, at least it was by me before I joined Spotify. So in in most other areas, whether you maybe work on at um, Twitter or you work with at Spotify with podcasts, 
product innovation, product development is, is largely about coming up with ideas, building them, and testing them. That's not true for music. <laughs> when you talk about music, product development means coming up with an, with an idea, going to you know three, four major labels, trying to negotiate the lowest common denominator that they can all agree on, and then test it. It's a very different product development process, right? And people forget that. It's, it's product development as the lowest common denominator of three or four huge contracts, basically. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you have to think differently. When you do product development here, if you're going to spend a year negotiating something, you have to be more careful. It's very, very expensive to be wrong. You First of all, you wasted that year of negotiation, but then you might have to live with those licenses, with, which were useless for three more years before they're renegotiated. Hmm. So the cost of being wrong in product development in music is just way, way higher than it is somewhere else where you just said like, well, that didn't work. Let's roll hmm. it back and try a different version. But for audio, for, uh, for instance, podcast hosts or something, the door is wide open, right? You don't have any of those constraints, any of those restrictions. So you can really follow um, any direction. This is one of the things I think is very exciting about uh, podcast. It is, it is a much more open landscape. It is, it's much more similar to, to other types of, of uh, product development where mm -hmm. we can try things like, you know, we want to try fan feedback, for example. We can just do that and see if the creators like that and if the fans like that. If we want to to uh, have, you know, um, like I said, interactivity, or we want to have new types of features, or we want to give the creators new tools, for example, to to insert things into their audio, those are not licensing questions. Those are basically um, evolution questions. Mm. Like, do people use them? Do they like them? In that case, they stick around. If they don't, they don't. So for me, it's quite exciting to be able to develop in in that more normal paradigm. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, it's been fascinating to learn how to develop product in, in the music landscape uh, yeah. by having to negotiate and understand the incentives of, of an entire uh, entire industry and making, making bets on a vastly different scale <laughs> where it's so yeah. much more expensive to be wrong. One thing that uh, Spotify is making bets on are these live audio platforms. Um, you've purchased Locker Room, and of course, this comes with the rise of Clubhouse. Um, kind of taking everyone by storm. What I'm surprised about, and, and Locker Room is mainly sports-related content, but I, I know that you guys have plans to kind of broaden that out beyond just sports. Why now? Why are these live audio platforms taking off at a moment when the technology seems to have been around for a while? Is it mainly because of COVID? It's, it's a really good question. I mean, it's almost weird that live happened in video before audio because it seems like video is higher bandwidth. It's harder to get latency lower. So it, it's unclear. I think, um, and I don't have a, a really good answer. I can't say this is what it is. But I think your intuition is right that uh, COVID probably accelerated this quite a lot mm -hmm. in terms of, um, it's not what I expected would happen. In fact, I would have thought the opposite. When people were home more, they were closer to a screen. So you would expect screen time to increase. And weirdly, what happened was people started listening more to non-screens. And and in retrospect, I can kind of I can kind of uh, work out maybe why that happened, because there's this revolution of of everyone having earbuds in their ear all the time, even when they're home. It's like you're walking around your private space, uh, and you know you're doing things. Now you're home all the time. Now now you're going to need to do things. You need to do chores and so forth. Mm -hmm. And so maybe it's not that surprising in retrospect that that listening would actually uh, increase in the home in in that. Uh, setting, but it wasn't what I s expected going in. I, I would have predicted maybe even it going down and um, TV viewing going up. So I was surprised by it. I think, but I think it's because of COVID that it accelerated. But this this is one of these things that I think I think is going to recede a bit after COVID is over. But I don't think it's going away. I think what it showed us was that this is a bit self serving, obviously. But Spotify has been saying for a long time that. Audio is probably as big as text, photos, and video before it. Why would it be this much more smaller space? And and you know financially, it's been a smaller space. And and we have said, and Daniel has said that Spotify is not less valuable; it's just undervalued. Like it's probably going to be as big as the others. And 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 we've seen it slowly. We saw podcasts go from you know two hundred thousand shows, and then 
Anchor came along, which we acquired, and it went to 2 million creators. So we've seen it grow even by 10x. But I think what this, what this wave shows is that it is, it is much, much bigger than even this. Mm -hmm. Literally, everyone is interested in creating audio. Just like it turned out, everyone was interested in creating text on Twitter. Everyone was interested in creating photos on Instagram. Or everyone was in interested in creating video. A few years before each of those, people said like, no, I don't, I don't think like hundreds of millions of people are going to do this. And that's exactly what people said about audio just a year and a half ago. Like, no, it's, it's maybe it's millions of creators, but it's not hundreds of millions. And not, now I think everyone says like, no, it's, it's hundreds of millions of creators. I'm sure about that, right? So that's what I think it showed. And that's extremely exciting for Spotify because that's the bet we've been making for a while now. But mm -hmm. I think we got sort of external confirmation that all these worries about people are, most people are not going to feel comfortable just talking. Even though they were comfortable talking on video, all of these concerns, I think, are gone now. So what, what I think this represents is just proof that the potential space of all creators is just much, much bigger than what we see today, which was true for text, photos, and video as well. Yeah, something that people might have thought of or written off as niche has suddenly become something that's that's mass market and, and you can scale. And you mentioned that everyone wants to get into this space. I'm thinking Facebook, Twitter, Discord, they all have plans for these live audio platforms. How does Spotify distinguish itself in such a crowded field? I mean, is there what else can you do beyond having, say, exclusively branded content? So I, I would almost turn the, the question around, actually, for, for audio, right? Mm. So, so in audio, we're already at hundreds of millions of, of users. We have the largest uh, you know, audio catalog and the most listeners and the most people uh, picking up an app to listen to audio daily. So there, I think it's the opposite. We're actually sort of the, the incumbent there. Um, so I think we're the, the best position. And it's more, the question is more how the others are going to uh, get into audio uh, than, than us getting into, into their space. Uh, but I do think there is plenty left to do in in um, in audio. Like like you said, we have our bet, and it's been going quite well. We're betting on on um, a combination of uh, having all the content plus a bunch of content exclusively that creates a flywheel for us, and that's been that's been quite successful. And we're keep we're going to keep doing that. But I do think, as I said, what what we're seeing and what we're expecting is that we're not talking about a few more creators or it, you know, it growing linearly, I think the number of creators that create is going to look exactly like the other mediums. It will be tens and hundreds of millions of, of creators, which yeah. means that the catalog will be much, much bigger than what we imagine today. And so that's the opportunity that, that we see, that audio is going to be as big as these other spaces. And from that position, we feel like we're the biggest in this space because we invested earlier that is going to explode. Of course, other people are going to c try to come into that space. It's not like um, there's there's one competitor in the tech spa text space and one in photos and one in video. Everyone is fighting for everything. That's that's completely normal. And that's as it should be. I think the question yeah, that, is: that, that, that's are, are we in a good out. position today? I think we are. And do we have exciting plans? Yes, but I won't share too much about those before they're live. Understood. Understood. Let's talk a little bit broader here. Um, you know, you look at you, you focus on product development, but you also look at the different business models of uh, the companies in your space and also just the big Silicon Valley firms overall. What companies, what business models do you admire the most? And, and when I posed this question to you earlier in our conversation offline, you had said that you like Google because it's got both advertising and subscription. When does one work better than the other? So I think in general, it's interesting with companies that can straddle multiple business models so it may be you can you can uh, fund uh, free access to a service you can fund paid access um and we recently also so, so spotify has traditionally had those two you had advertising which meant that you could you could start using spotify for free even when you thought music was not worth a lot of your money and mm -hmm. then you convince yourself that it was and you started paying right so for us that was very convenient i also think when it comes to to podcasting and information there is an important argument in that, um, which is not very popular right now in the world, which is that it is quite a good thing to have most of the world's information available for free because everyone, if you have to pay, many people would just not get access to that information. And there is there's this other risk that the some of the most valuable or important information becomes paid, right? 
and that maybe the, the the less trustworthy information would be the one that stays free. So I think there's an there's an important thing to remember that um, all the consumers in the world getting access to mostly all the information in the world for free as they did with, with Google, it's actually a pretty fantastic deal. That was probably pretty good for for uh, for the world and for individuals. Now, for Spotify specifically, I think it's this possibility of supporting different types of creators. Some content create some uh, creators create content that is mass market appeal, and then an advertising model is probably the best way for them to make a living. If they charge for that, they would make less money than if they used advertising. But there's a problem with that because you have other types of content that are too niche to really make sense for an advertising model. But on the other hand, that that audience is actually prepared to quite pay quite a lot. So so. While Spotify has previously supported both ads and subscription, until recently, we didn't support this third model where a creator said, I actually want to charge for my content because I have a more niche audience, but they're prepared to pay. So we recently started supporting that as well. And, and this, is what I, this is what I believe in. And this is what Daniel talks about as well, that we, we, we don't think that business models is a one size fits all. Mm -hmm. We think that the future platforms will allow for different types of business models. And I think that's crucial because I think the business model drives the type of content that can be created. So we say it's uh, advertising or nothing. We're only going to get one type of content. And so now we're trying to allow for all types of content to exist on the platform. And that's something that's very exciting to me because we say that we want to be the world's audio network, but that doesn't really make sense if you only allow some types of content to, mm. to, to really work on the platform and, and monetize. You've also said that you want Spotify to be the research and development of the music industry, which sounds great. It's a great soundbite, but I'm not quite sure I understand what that means. So can you break that down for us? Uh, that, that was actually, so I, I can, that was a long time ago when we thought about what to, what to, um, what to call ourselves. And I, I wanted to set something uh, like a high ambition for, for the teams. Uh -huh. And, uh, you know, having worked in other industries, most other industries, they have a lot of R&D, they have a lot of smart people working on building products for them. And the, the thing that struck me about the music industry was, I mean, it's it's all the labels. And the labels had, at least back then, they had very few engineers. There just wasn't any R&D in the music industry at all. They were just they were just monetizing the IP they had, and they relied on, on you know, s someone else, uh, the CD makers or, or um, iTunes or something to do the R&D. And so I just wanted to set the ambition and say, like, well, music seems to have no... R&D department, there's no one doing, there's no one innovating in mm -hmm. on the consumer side. So let's make the goal uh, be that we are that R&D department. Now we have competing R&D departments in other companies that also try to innovate. That's a great outcome for the music industry and for artists. Now there's competition for, for the consumer experience. So it's thinking about breaking the mold and how you can break the mold and how you can reinvent what's been around. Um, exactly. Journalists and a lot of people in PR who, frankly, let's face it, are former journalists, tend to get lazy. And we like to use a lot of shorthand for describing things and identifying new themes. So after Warby Parker came out and disrupted the eyewear industry, there are a lot of, you know, new Warby Parkers of blank. So there's Warby Parker for belts or something. Um, and then, of course, there was Uber, which became the in-demand economy, right? There was uh, Uber for private jets, Uber for blank. What do you think the shorthand is for Spotify? What do you want Spotify to be shorthand for? This, what would it mean to be the Spotify of blank? Such a great question. Now, I actually do see a lot of pitches and pitch decks that does include where the Spotify for, for blank. And uh, so, so that's not necessarily what I would want it to mean. But what, what that usually means is that they take something where you paid per item, like music, you paid per download, right? Or you paid per CD, and you turn it into an access model where you pay a fixed fee or or you use advertising. But you, you go from per item access or download access to um, flat access. So I think that's what most entrepreneurs mean when they say with the Spotify for something. We take an industry where you paid a marginal cost per item, mm -hmm. and instead you pay a flat access. And what's interesting about that is that for music, it turned out to to uh, as, as often is the case with what is called bundling. Basically, you can think of the entire catalog now as a big bundle, all these tracks bundled together for a single consumer price. And that turned out to maximize. It took a long time for the music industry to get back 
after the pirate era, but it's growing very, very quickly now. So that turned out to optimize the, the global industry for, it was a great consumer deal. So more consumers paid. So that actually generated more money to the music industry than happened in the marginal cost model. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what I think people mean with the Spotify 4. We turned this from a from an, uh, sort of per item to a uh, flat access model. What do you want that, that comparison to mean in the future? Um, I don't know. I, th I think, uh, I think you know, the co that we will be representative of putting an access model, business model on top of a per item model is, is quite, a, quite a cool thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess it would also, I would love it for it to imply taking on, um, taking on a complicated industry that most people recommend uh, against going into <laughs> and trying to solve a harder problem. Yeah, entrenched indus industries which have no uh, interest at all in changing how they do anything and, and breaking it apart and putting it back together, essentially. But the, the important thing is there, there's a lot of talk about disrupting industries, but that's not what Spotify did. We actually uh -huh. work with the industry and the same industry is bigger, right? And that, that's important. It's easy to say we're going to go in and disrupt and kill this industry. Spotify actually did the opposite. We started negotiating with them from day one. It took a long and painful route which is often recommended against. The, the recommendation is to try to go in and disrupt and destroy. But that, so the record labels Spotify. see Spotify as their friend as rather than their enemy? For, for sure. I mean, where the, we're the majority of their, of their revenue now streaming is. What about musicians, though? A lot of musicians um, say they can't make a, a livable wage off of their, their streaming proceeds. It's a very complicated question. I mean, we try to look at are we are we growing the pie or not? Is there more and more money going to rights holders every year? And that's super clear. It's growing very very fast, and you know beyond the the what was called the golden days of the of the CD industry. Mm -hmm. And we're also looking at you know our our uh, deals with the with the labels are while not transparent, quite well known. We pay out the the vast majority of any dollar we make mm -hmm. to the rights industry. Now there are many complicated. Um, uh, there are many complicated uh, parts in between there and when, what uh, revenues creator sees. And you also have many, many more people participating now and creating music, which obviously is a great thing. I mean, we want more creators. I think most creators think it's great that more creators get a chance. But that also means that while the pie is growing, there are also more creators at the same time. So it's a very complicated question to uh, to solve. We're trying yeah. to be transparent with what we're doing and we're trying to be fair in how we pay out. I started this conversation by saying that you've founded two companies um, in your career so far. Um, and the first one, of course, was Kenneth Works that you sold to Yahoo. You started a second company while you were working at Spotify called 13th Lab. Explain to us how you had time to do this when you were overseeing product and engineering at Spotify. What's this company about and does it have any link at all to Spotify? It actually doesn't have any any link to Spotify. I was always very passionate about um, computer vision, which is why I'm also very interested in, in machine learning because computer vision basically turned into machine learning after a while. And uh, so I've been passionate about that since long before I started at, at Spotify. And um, while I was working at Spotify, there was this technology called uh, SLAM, Simultaneous Localization and Mapping, that I thought was really interesting. That was very, very early. It didn't really work. You could get it to work on some big desktop computers decently. But I was also interested in this concept of exponential growth of computing, mm -hmm. inspired by Ray Kurzweil and these things back then. So uh, I decided, together with some friends, to make a bet on that. If the exponential increase in computing power was actually true, then this algorithm that could barely run on big desktop com computers at all, it would actually run just fine on an iPhone just a few years down the line, if, if it was really true that computing power would keep being exponential. So we made a bet with that, and I found some great people, again, from the Royal Institute of Technology, who were actually the CEO. So I didn't, I didn't work in this company. I just founded it. Mm. And um, they managed to get this, this uh, algorithm, SLAM algorithm, to work. And uh, it turned out to be right. A few years down the line, they actually were, I think, the first one to get it working in a commercial iPhone app. And then later on, with this whole computer vision craze that happened, uh, the big tech companies realized that this algorithm was really important. And so 
it was acquired by Facebook to be used in the in the Oculus Quest to for for tracking and of of uh, the real world. Very nice exit strategy there for uh, for Thirteenth Lab. I want to um, bring in our. Um, question and audience, question and answer segment. Usually for Cornell Tech, we um, have a live audience and people raise their hands and ask questions. Uh, we're obviously virtual because you're in Stockholm, I'm in New York. So we've uh, lined up two Cornell Tech students to ask questions. So why don't I bring them in? We've got Gabby Silver and Scott Hillman with us today. Gabby, why don't you take it away? Hi, thank you so much for the chat. It was Hi, extremely Gabby. enlightening. Um, so I've been to over 175 events and I'm dying to get back to concerts. Um, thank you for teaching me. me too. <laughs> so I feel totally the same. And um, uh, Spotify really, you know, talked about kind of the scale of the digital reach of the world's audio network. So I wanted to talk a little bit more about like the physical audio network, which is shows. So I want to ask you like, what convenience will you bring to like the live, um, audio discovery process? Yeah, so fantastic question. And um, as, as you probably know, for many artists, uh, why, why COVID has been so tough is because a huge part of their, um, of their income, for many, actually the majority, comes from live touring. And that just disappeared last year, which is part of this question of why artists are having a really tough time right now. And so, one of the things we want to do, so so there's been a lot of focus on virtual live now, but I think one of the things that is important that we started doing already before COVID is to think about how we can help artists with physical live. So the first things we did was, first things we could do that was that were unique to us is we have this um, experience called Spotify for Artists, S4A, which is literally an iPhone app that artists can download where they then can see how they're doing on Spotify. And one of the most requested features there was to understand what, who is listening, what type of audience do I have and where? Basically, how should I plan my next tour to be able to, to get to the most of my fans? And so we invested quite a lot in that to be able to help artists understand exactly which five cities they could, should go to because they're, they, they're gonna have enough fans. So that's one thing. The next obvious thing is if we know that these are the fans and they live there and you're going to go there, couldn't we help you sell those tickets as well? So that's the next thing that we built. I mean, we know based on your listening, who is the most likely fan to buy your tickets. So those are the things we've been investing in, trying to help you plan the tour. And once you plan the tour, help you to sell tickets. Now, now during COVID, that hasn't helped very much because you couldn't tour. But hopefully this is one of the things that does come back with a vengeance once people are vaccinated. It sounds like it could be its own business um, and something that could eventually be spun off maybe from Spotify. Maybe. I mean, our goal is back to this question of, of artists. Our, our goal is to get, you know, a million artists to be able to live off of their art. This is this is our vision and billions of fans to be inspired by it. And if you look at that number, to be able to live off of their art, you know, well mm -hmm. off of their art. Now, many more, many, many more creators, but at least a million should be able to live off of it. That puts a very big burden on us. We need to find more revenue sources and bigger revenue sources. So Spotify is always looking, apart from our royalties, for how could we bring more revenues to artists yeah. and, and, and other creators, like in podcasts. I just said that we're allowing creators now to, to charge for episodes if they want to. And we, we actually take a 0% fee of that until 2023. And if you want to, you can even put your podcast on Spotify without paying us anything. So we're really trying to sort of put our money where our mouth is and give more and more options for creators to be able to make money off of, off of their fans, right? And their fandom on, on Spotify. So that's the journey that Spotify is, is on. So that would be the reason to not spin it out. For us, it's just like, we're going to try to make it possible to make a living off of this mm. for as many people as possible. So this is one clear path, is physical touring. All right, let's bring in Scott Hillman, who also has a question for Gustav. Scott, you with us? Yeah, hi there. Um, hi, Gustav. Thanks for being with us today. Um, first off, I've been really enjoying listening to Spotify product story recently. Just wanted to say that it's very cool how you've, you know, been willing to pull back the curtain on that story and share that with the world. So thank you for that. Um, you. My question is around Spotify's approach to social features within the product. So longtime Spotify users understand that the, these social features have kind of made their way in and out of the product over the years. Um, but when I look at the recent partnership, uh, the Boombox partnership with Facebook, 
I wonder why is this happening now? And does it mean that your stance to social product features have changed um, recently? And if so, why? So this is a really interesting question because as you don't know, as a long time Spotify user, you said it's been going in and out. That's really true. We invested a lot in user to user social features for a while. And then uh, we didn't invest so much for a while. The, the initial um, reason for investing in user to user social feature was actually to solve discovery. But then we realized that, and you can think of that as um, you have a friend that is good at recommending music to you. Then the whole machine learning revolution happened and we built this team of editorial plus algorithmic called Algotorial. And it turns out that many people actually don't have a friend that is really good at music in their taste, right? Some do, but many, many don't. And we found that we could basically build this friend for you. And so it was just a more pragmatic way or a more effective way of solving discovery was to give everyone a you know, digital friend, an algorithmal friend, you know, a few hours of, of one of our paid editors plus our algorithms. So that's one reason why we didn't invest so much in user to user social, because we, find other, we found other ways of solving the discovery problem. Um, so the thing we are investing in quite a lot though is, and, and where I think we have underinvested is um, creator to user social, right? So I, I think there are plenty of networks out in the world where users can talk to each other, right? There's social, so many social networks. We talking about focus, we haven't felt that it was our role to be yet another social network for, for talking to each other. We were about listening to creators. And if social didn't really help you listen to creators because discovery was already solved by, by, by Algotorial, we didn't invest so much in it. However, we think that creation, uh, consumption of audio, music and talk should not be a one-way experience forever the way it is today. Most of the other mediums are much more interactive now between the creator and the fans. If you look at text, video, photos and so forth. So why would audio stay this one-way opaque medium? And we don't think it will. So we are very interested in uh, fans being able to talk to the creators and creators being able to talk to the fans. So we are investing in that kind of social, if that makes sense. But we haven't invested so much in, in user-to-user -user, uh, social. All right, that was, that was a really smart question. Thank you so much, Gabby and Scott. Um, Gustav, I really wanna thank you for taking the time. You're joining us from Stockholm. Um, this is the wonderful thing about Cornell Tech at Bloomberg that we're able to do these conversations now virtually and, and speak with anyone anywhere in the world. So it's been a treat to, to have you on with us today. Uh, Gustav, thank you so much. Uh, before we say goodbye to Gustav Soderstrom of Spotify, I wanna bring in someone to give us our closing remarks. And he is Josh Hartman. He's the Chief Practice Officer at Cornell Tech. Josh. Thanks, Scarlett. Hi, I'm Josh Hartman, Chief Practice Officer at Cornell Tech, where I help lead our signature studio entrepreneurship programs for our graduate students. Thanks again, as always, to our hosts at Bloomberg, Cornell Tech, and Tech NYC, and to our moderator, Scarlett Fu from Bloomberg, and especially to our guest, Gustav Soderstrom from Spotify. Spotify's journey to be the singular leader in bringing the music industry into the streaming era has been so inspiring. At Cornell Tech, we've been honored that Spotify has been a longtime partner with us, sponsoring product challenges in Product Studio and engaging with our teams in Bitco Studio. We've got a great case study up on our website about a team of our students exploring social music discovery on the Spotify platform. We've just wrapped up an academic year unlike any other where we've been mostly online, but we're now looking forward to a fully in-person start to our semester this fall on Roosevelt Island. Now is the perfect time for companies and organizations to get involved with our studio program. If you're interested, please visit cornelltech.io pc21. Thank you again and good day. <laughs>